My name is Ali Sivji. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Kaya Sivjis. I've actually tweeted a link to uh, my slides on my Twitter, but don't worry about that right now. Sit back and enjoy the show. Honestly, it's the, the second day or the third day of this conference, the last talk before keynotes. I can pretty much say anything, and I don't really think anybody's going to think any different or understand anything. Uh, so I am one of the organizers of the Chicago Python Users Group. We call ourselves Chippy. Chippy is one of the largest Python communities in the world. We have around 6,000 members, and every month we hold four to six events. Normally this time, I invite folks to come out to Chicago and come to a Chippy event if they ever happen to be in town, but we've had to postpone all of our in-person events until it's safe to meet in large groups. But we have started doing virtual events. So we recently started live streaming our events to our YouTube channel. There's no reason to visit Chicago, although I still hope that you do come when things clear up. So subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit that bell icon, and you'll get notified of our upcoming events. Hope to see you on the live stream. So this talk is called Pluggable Architecture. Plugins are software components that we can extend or enhance and do that for an existing program that we already have. A plugin is also known as an extension or an add-on. Technically, there are different tech, uh, definitions of these, but for the purposes of this talk, we're going to use them interchangeably. So if we start looking around, we can find applications with plugins pretty much everywhere we look. Web browsers, they're the most, compl uh, they're the most uh, used piece of software. And each browser, it has an ecosystem of third-party libraries that manage plugins for things like ad blocking, password management, key bindings for Vim, and of course, JavaScript developer tools. Our IDEs and our text editors also have plugins. So in VS Code, I have plugins to make it easier to debug JavaScript, to improve my user experience, to interact with third-party tools and websites like Docker, like GitHub. It also adds support for a query language. Media players, they use plugins to add support for new file types, to change the user interface. They call those skins. Does anybody remember those awesome visualization plugins from Winamp? WordPress, that's a popular content management system. It's estimated that WordPress powers 35% of the internet. And there are thousands upon thousands of WordPress plugins that let you customize every aspect of WordPress. There's a plugin called WooCommerce, and that enables e-commerce on your website. WooCommerce has its own plugin systems, so you can write plugins for a plugin. Your favorite web framework, it's also got a way to extend it with uh, third-party tools and libraries. So if we can add things like custom middleware, custom serializers, custom ORM fields, all of these things, they make web development a little bit easier. There are many benefits in implementing a plugin system. The biggest one is that plugins make it easier to develop new features. Plugins allow us to split our program's functionality into logical chunks. This makes our program smaller and easier to understand. For instance, we don't need to understand exactly how that base application works in order to extend it. And a great benefit is that third-party developers can leverage our plugin architecture and design solutions that fit their needs, that fit their users' needs. Could you imagine using a web browser without an extension? We also have to discuss the trade-offs of using plugins. I don't like to think of these as disadvantages, more along the lines of things we need to consider when we're making these kinds of decisions. Like everything else, in uh, object-oriented programming, when we're implementing a solution, we have to spend a lot of upfront time doing design. We have to consider how our plugins are going to interact with our host application. Plugins also mean that we have to add existing, we have to add complexity to our existing code base to support these, uh, these additions. And we have to make sure that it's actually worth doing. Is this complexity worth it? But before we dive in a little bit deeper, I want to talk about what my goals are for this talk. 
By the end of this session, I hope to provide you enough knowledge where you can go out and write a plugin for any application or library that you uh, want to write a plugin for. This necessarily doesn't have to be in Python. The concepts that we're going to talk about, they can be applied across the board. We're going to start by deconstructing plugin systems into their base components. And then we're going to use this information to build a small application that has a plugin system. I like doing things with first principles. So the best way to learn how to write a plugin is to actually make a plugin system. While we do implement a naive implementation of a plugin system, we're not going to have a lot of time to discuss what's actually required to add a plugin system to your existing application. If you're looking to do that, I have a couple recommendations for you. Doug Hellman gave a talk at PyCon 2013 about different techniques we can use to dynamically run code at, uh, to dynamically load code at runtime. Doug created the Stevedore plugin, a uh, Stevedore library for plugins based on all the things he learned when implementing this pattern. The second talk is by Rose Judge, and it's about uh, Rose's experience using Stevedore to implement a plugin system for an open source library. Both of these talks are great, and I use them as resources for this talk. So I want to thank both Doug and George, oh, sorry, Doug and Rose for, uh, for sharing this knowledge. So before we do get started diving into plugins, I want to share my experience writing my first plugin. I'm a huge fan of Swagger Docs. Swagger, it's a way of specifying our API. We can use that API specification to create things like documentation. We can also automate it, uh, our code generation for our client libraries for generating our tests. My favorite Python web framework is Falcon. I think it's awesome because it has a great API, it's lightweight, and it's easy to extend. This framework, it's not as popular as a Django or a Flask. And that means the ecosystem of third-party libraries is not as robust. So while I did find one API documentation generator, it produced, it, it produced documentation, but it didn't hook into any sort of serialization framework, any sort of data validation framework. So if I wanted to generate valid documentation, I would still have to do a little bit of manual work. So after researching how other frameworks generated API documentation, I found API spec. And this is a pluggable API specification generator that is framework agnostic, and it has built-in support for Marshmallow data validation. There were no uh, generators for Falcon web applications, but there was a section of the documentation on how we can go about writing my own plugin. I learned that the library can allow me to augment behavior of the base library with helper methods. I saw how it can pass information into the plugins as they're initialized. And most importantly, the documentation pointed me to where to go next. It told me to go look at an existing plugin. I already know Flask pretty well, so I started digging into the Flask plugin to find out how I could replicate its behavior. So I grabbed the quick start from the API spec documentation, started diving into the code. So a Flask application, we need to add some Swagger specification inside of a doc string. And it produces the specification we see on the right side. Next, I added a breakpoint inside of this plugin. And then I started tracing through that execution. I did a DIR here, did a pretty, bit, a pretty print there. And I was able to sort of figure out what data structures were required to pass messages around inside of the program. And so now we're going to have to dig into the internals of Falcon to find the same kind of information. I created a minimal Falcon app and started digging into how Falcon stores the route maps, how do functions and classes view to uh, like map to, uh, to API endpoints. After connecting some dots, I created, I uh, packaged up my code, wrote some tests and put it up on PyPI. This library solved my problem. I sort of figured it would solve other people's problems as well. And that's one of the great things about open source. We can build on the things before us to accomplish a lot without that much code. Like I didn't have to write an API generation framework. I just had to write that plugin. And this was my first experience developing a plugin. It went pretty well. 
uh, kudos to the developers and the documentation writers for making this process easy. Since then, I've written a few other plugins and I started to notice a little bit of a pattern. While each plugin I wrote was different, they all shared the same underlying characteristics. So what makes a plugin system a plugin system? When we have a plugin by itself, it doesn't really do us any good. A plugin needs to be a part of something larger. It needs to plug into something. And we call that something the host application. Plugins and hosts need a way to communicate with each other. And this communication channel could be something like calling a function, getting a result back, or it could be writing um, a plugin that communicates over a protocol like WebSockets. There needs to be some sort of two-way communication channel. When we have a plugin, there needs to be a way for us to register it with the host application. And this can be done many different ways. Some programs specify a folder that are where you store all your plugins. And then when the program starts up, all the plugins in that folder are loaded. And if this sounds familiar, it's sort of the way that Python does things. When we pip install a library, it goes into our site packages, and then we can just import it into our Python process. Other programs have a require you to be a little bit more explicit. This is a snippet from my settings.py inside of Django. And you can see here, I have to explicitly specify all my layers of middleware. And once a program is registered and loaded, it needs to be able to respond to the host application when it's called. If the plugin is registered with the actions that it cares about, then the host application is only going to call that plugin when those actions uh, get triggered. Now that we know what goes into a plugin system, let's make one of our own. So this is the plugin checklist we just talked about. We're going to come back to this at the end of the section, but I just want to keep have you keep it in the back of your mind as we run through this exercise. One of my favorite parts of Python is the Python package index. Chances are, if you need to do something, there's a library or at least some code out there that can help you accomplish, uh, help you do what you want to do. But if you find multiple packages, how do you decide which one to use? Some of the ways I make the decision are I look at the number of open issues, look at the number of open pull requests. I look at the number of stars, shows how popular it is when the last time it was updated. All of these things help me understand how actively maintained this project is. So instead of going on to each individual GitHub page, I'm going to write a tool that's going to get this information using an API. So we're going to build a command line tool that where you submit a URL, it's going to print out some repo statistics. The majority of projects that we're going to use are probably going to be on GitHub. There's going to be the odd one here or there on GitLab. So those are the ones we're going to support out the, uh, just to start with. And then if we ever need to support Bitbucket, we're going to build it with a plugin system so we can do that a little bit later. So let's not worry about that at this moment. So we're going to need our MVP to take in a URL. And then we're going to have to use a provider API to download some statistics. And as I mentioned, the most important part is we want to build with a plugin system. So let's start by defining the data objects we need inside of our program. We're going to have a repo details type. It's going to be a name tuple that takes an organization and a string for like the project. We're going to have the repo statistics. That's also a name tuple. And that's going to hold all the information that we care about that we just uh, we want to retrieve from the API. And now we're going to walk through how we can use the GitHub API to get this information. We're going to want to check that this URL is actually a GitHub URL. Next, we're going to use the request library to go out, hit that API. And then finally, we're going to parse that response and extract the information that we care about. Now that we've had these steps to require to solve our problem, let's generalize it a little bit. We're going to create a class, call it base plugin. We're going to initialize it with a repo. We're going to have a check method that takes in a domain and it returns true or false. 
And this is going to allow us to identify which URLs belong to which plugins. And finally, we're going to have a method that abstracts out going out to the API for that provider and getting this information. So let's walk through how we would implement the GitHub plugin. First, we're going to create a class called GitHub plugin. It's going to have base plugin as its parent. We're going to override that default check method. And here we're going to return true if the domain is github.com. We're going to override our repo stats method. And here we're just going to go out to the API, get that information, and put it inside of that data transfer object. We're also going to need to create a plugin for GitLab. Again, we're going to create a class. This time, it's going to be a GitLab plugin. The same base plugin is going to be the parent. We're going to overwrite that check function. If it's GitLab, we'll return true. If not, we'll return false. And just like before, we're going to use the request library to go out to the API and get that information and send it back to the caller. Now that we know how the plugins work, let's examine our host application to see how we're going to use these plugins. So we're going to start by adding these two plugins we created to a list. Next, we're going to create a class just called GitHub API Client. We're going to initialize this class with the URL. We're going to parse this URL. And here we just have a private function that's going to grab the domain as well as the organization and the project. Then we're going to loop through each of the plugins till we find the plugin that matches the domain we care about. If we do find one, we'll assign it to an instance variable. If that plugin doesn't exist, we're just going to raise a value error that we don't really support that, uh, that URL at this time. It might be an indication that uh, somebody could write a plugin for it later. And now our host application class, it's going to have a method that goes out to the API and it fetches statistics using that specific plugin, uh, that instance that we just set. Now when we run this code, we're going to get that same output as before after some formatting. We designed this application with a plugin system, and it's great. So imagine we want to just add Bitbucket. And we can support that fairly easily. So the way I'd go about implementing it is just like before, I'd create another class and overwrite those methods. This time, I would be focusing on things that are specific for the Bitbucket plugin. And then I'm just going to have to update my host application with the, Bitbu plug the Bitbucket plugin inside of that list. It should work as expected. So taking a look at that checklist, does our system have an a host application? Looking at the diagram, yeah, I think it does. So we can check that off. Next is, do we have a communication channel between our host and our plugin? The host and the plugin do communicate by sending messages to, the, uh, to each other. We're using uh, like object-oriented programming. So we're going to have a value returned. So yeah, that's a check mark as well. Does our plugin need to register with our host application? From our host application code, yeah, we register plugins at the top. So yeah, that works as well. Are these plugins loaded dynamically at startup? So until the code reads this one line at the top for the first time, it has no idea what plugins are going to be loaded. So yeah, I think that works as well. And then for the last bullet, are we going to respond when our program is called upon by the host application? Yeah, when we call something, it's going to return a value. So yeah, it looks like everything is good to go. And we can give it our stamp of approval. It's a certified plugin. Now that we've built a plugin system from scratch, I think it'd be good to explore a few implementations of plugin systems uh, for popular Python libraries to sort of see how they've done things. Django is a popular Python framework. Django is very opinionated, and, it'll, and the developers have allowed you to uh, customize it in many different ways. If you just look at the Django documentation, you can see all of these things just in that index of the documentation. And this doesn't even include all the reusable apps you can use. Most people, if they're making an API, they use a tool like Django REST framework. If they're building uh, something in the cloud, they'll use like Django storages. So how can we write custom code for Django? So we're going to explore how we can write custom middleware. In Django, what middleware is, it's something that hooks into the Django 
request response processing cycle. So this is what our middleware list is going to be in our settings py. Before the request comes into our view function, as it's going through our framework, it's going to pass through each of these layers. And then once it gets to the view and it's going to go out, it's going to go back through these layers before getting sent out to the client. So with middleware, we're able to modify our requests as well as our responses. So how does middleware look in the code? I pull this straight from the Django documentation. So we're going to start by creating a class. Notice how it doesn't have a base class. We're just going to use duct typing here. The middleware, it's going to be initialized with an argument. It's going to take in a variable. We're just going to save that to an instance variable. And in the dunder call method, we're going to pass in our request. And here we're going to write code that's executed before uh, the view is run and before lower levels of middleware are run. Then we're going to call this function from the instance variable to signal that our middleware is done with the request. And then the following section, we're going to have some code that we can add some information if we want to process this request on the way out to the client. And then we'll just send it out to know that our middleware is done with this response on the way out. Now that we know what to do, we can write up our own middleware that's going to add a unique ID to each incoming request. So let's create a class. We're going to call it request UUID middleware. We're going to initialize it as before. This is pretty much boilerplate. And then when we create our dunder call method, it's going to have some logic that checks to see if there's something already in the header. If there's an ID in the header, we're just going to keep using that. If not, we're then going to generate a new request ID. And then we'll get this object before uh, calling it out and sort of letting the framework know that we don't have to do anything else. And since we're not doing anything with the response, we're only doing things on the way in, we don't need to have anything between these uh, two lines. And now that we update our settings.py with this new layer of middleware, we're good to go. I'm just going to add some tests to confirm things work, and we're good to go. So another Python, another Python library I wanted to explore was Flask. We really can't show how things are done in Django without showing how things are done in Flask. Flask is also a Python web framework. It builds itself as a micro framework. I don't know how micro I would consider Flask, but it's uh, still a lot more lightweight than, uh, than other ones out there. It's also not very opinionated. And since it's not as opinionated, there aren't as many hooks which we can use to extend functionality. And that's not to say that Flask isn't customizable. The design philosophy of Flask is more along the lines of, we can add third-party libraries, but we have to wire them up ourselves. Now, there's not a lot of built-in tooling to do that for us. So the ecosystem does have a lot of best practices. And so there's tools like uh, Flask SQL Alchemy if you want to add like an ORM layer. I would say that Flask is more plug and play than Django. It doesn't really make choices for you, but as I mentioned, there are preferences in the ecosystem. So let's take a look at how we can write some custom middleware for Flask. So in order to modify our requests and our responses, in Flask, we're going to have to write some WSGI middleware, which I believe is the web services gateway interface. It's just a little bit lower level. We're going to create a class. It has a doc string. And this class, it needs to be initialized with an app, sort of boilerplate code here. Next, we're going to create a dunder call method. It's going to take in some parameters. From the information that were passed in, we're going to generate a request object. If that request object has an ID, we're going to use that, uh, just keep it going forward. If not, we'll generate a new UUID. And then we're going to update our environment with this information and sort of just pass it along to the next layer of middleware or to the view. We're going to have to go into the Flask uh, like configuration and just sort of update the WSGI app attribute of the Flask application to just signify that we're adding this level, uh, this layer of middleware. And now we can add some tests to confirm everything works the way it should.
And the last Python plugin system I want to talk about is for PyTest. PyTest is a popular testing framework. It can also be used as just a test runner. And there are two different ways we can extend PyTest. There's PyTest fixtures and there's also hooks. So let's start by talking about fixtures. PyTest is built with a fixture model. Test fixtures in general enable us to set up a test environment so our test can run with deterministic state. And then after the test is run, our fixture is going to reset the environment to what it was originally. In PyTest, fixtures are functions that run before our tests, as well as functions that run after that test. And we can sort of signify them with the at pytest.fixture decorator. And then PyTest is going to enable us to inject our fixtures into our test functions as function parameters. And there are many different ways we can use PyTest fixtures, but the idea is that we want to change our tests, like we want to change the inside of our test function in some way. So here's a couple of PyTest fixtures I use to uh, create a, a Flask test client in order for API testing. And then anytime I want to write a test case that uses my API, I just inject that fixture into my test function. Before we do talk about hooks, I want to talk about hook-based plugin systems. A hook is a point where we can identify that this is where the application can be extended. When we're adding a plugin system to our app, this is, these are things that we need to think about, like where can we start adding this custom functionality? And when the host program first loads up, all the enabled plugins, they're registered with their respective hooks. And then when the program runs, every time a hook is triggered, the program's going to go through all the functions, all the plugins that this hook cares about or they, that wants to know about this hook. And it's going to go out and notify them that something did happen. So if we do dig, in, dig into the PyTest code base, you can see that a lot of core functionality has been implemented with hook-based plugins. So once PyTest starts, all the plugins in the uh, single, uh, in the uh, underscore PyTest directory, they're all registered with Pluggy. And Pluggy is PyTest's uh, plugin management and hook configuration tool. Now that we know all that, how do we go out and write a PyTest hook plugin? First, we need to figure out what we want to build. And then we're going to have to find a hook that's going to uh, help us implement that desired functionality. PyTest has many different points where we can call hooks. I didn't really have a lot of time to get a list of all of them, but I'll be updating these slides like in the next couple of weeks. So let's talk about how we're going to write a sample hook-based plugin. And this example I grabbed from the advanced PyTest talk from last year's EuroPython. So we start by using the PyTest underscore add option hook. And that's going to allow us to customize the command line arguments for when we call PyTest. So here we're just going to add an, uh, a flag for fast to signify that we only want to run our, or we don't want to run our slow tests. And then next we're going to have a hook for the PyTest collection modify items hook. And this test, it's run after PyTest does all the test discovery. Here, what we can do is we can take all the tests that, we've been, that have been discovered and we can uh, specify which ones we actually want to run. So if we do have that fast configuration set, we can signify we don't want to run any test that was marked as slow. And here's just that code to do that. Testing PyTest plugins are sort of beyond the scope of this talk, but I sort of just wanted to show that this did work. So before we did have two tests that pass, and then we move into uh, one test selected and one test pass. Or sorry, one test deselected and one test selected. In this section, we talked about how we can extend three popular uh, Python libraries. The plugin systems, they're implemented in different ways, but the steps for creating a plugin, they were more or less the same. So now that we know how to implement our own naive 
plugin system, and we've seen some plugin systems in action, I also wanted to provide you with some tips that you can go out and use when you write your next plugin. I thought the best way to do this was to think about the process I would go through if I was writing a plugin for a host application I, I had never really encountered before. So the first thing is, does this application have a plugin system? We really can't extend application that doesn't support this, uh, this model. So how do you find out if an application has a plugin system? You go out and you read the documentation. So the best way to find out how to extend something is to read that documentation of that something. And so that would be the host application. So the keywords I would search for would be extend, customize, add-on, maybe do the root word like custom. And in the docs, there's probably gonna be links for how you can uh, find existing plugins. And if they don't have these links and you're just like looking for places to start, I would recommend checking out PyPI, uh, checking out maybe like Google just doing a search there. And an underrated resource is GitHub search. I feel like I could find a lot of code that people don't really share, but if you just do a search for it, uh, you'll usually like run across something. Might have to change a line or two here or there, but for the most part, it's good to go. And once you do have uh, an application and a plugin that you want to play with, I suggest creating a sandbox development environment. And so this is going to be a minimal project setup that's going to have a plugin, uh, sorry, the host application and a single plugin. And if you just have this base configuration, it's going to allow you to iterate faster and it's going to make debugging a lot easier. And then once you're ready to build, maybe you can take this, uh, this template and use it to create your project. And as you're playing around in your sandbox environment, don't be afraid to go in and add breakpoints to code that you don't own. The only way to figure out what messages are being passed back and forth is to like get in there and understand what's going on. Like PDB is definitely a useful tool. And sometimes you won't be able to access that kind of information in the host. Like you can't PDB into there. Like I designed a plugin for uh, the Elgato Stream Deck and that's like communicating over WebSockets. But this plugin manager had a way where I can uh, signal, signal messages as like log messages. So if I did that, I was able to leverage the existing functionality of this application and log to a known point. You might also be able to log in your plugin, whatever sort of works for that, uh, that type of application. And once you have your plugin, it's working and it's good to go, it's time to start thinking about how this plugin that you wrote fits in with other plugins in this host application ecosystem. So if you do want to release your plugin, the best thing to do is to like find another plugin and sort of just copy and like use that as a template and copy a lot of the same practices they use. It also could mean something like using uh, exceptions that users would know about if they're using the host application you sort of have to get familiar with how the host application works. For testing plugins, there's a lot of material we can cover, but the main idea is that we wanna write integration tests to ensure that our plugin works with the host application. That's sort of like the real thing that we really care about. And if you do write a plugin that supports multiple different versions, you have to test against every single version. If you have a plugin that interfaces between two different pieces of software and you have multiple versions, your test, you're gonna to have to test every single combination. If you have a cross-platform plugin, it might be good to do tests for Mac, for Linux, and for Windows. So let's recap. Plugins are software components that allow us to extend or enhance existing software. While plugin systems can be designed in many different ways, they share a lot of common characteristics. Taking the things that we learned by writing our own plugin system, as well as looking at how other libraries implement plugin systems, we can see that it's not really too difficult to go out and extend functionality for your favorite library. So the next time you find yourself working on something complex, stop, take a step back, and breathe. Break the problem down into manageable chunks. You got this, it's not that hard. These are all the resources I found coming up with this talk.
if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. I do want to give an acknowledgement to the Chicago Python users group. I would not be really where I am as a developer without that fantastic organization and all the mentorship I got from uh, the Python community. So thank you. Well, and thank you for giving back. Thanks, Calvin. No, thank thank you for all you do as well. Like I, I've I've been to IndyPy and I love I love the the community down there.